when we begin to look in chapter 5 in this book, we reflect back to chapter 4 and we remember there were some things we discussed about chapter 4 that was going on. There was external strife. They were, they were having trouble and issues as they were started repairing the walls. They were getting, the Jews were beginning to be uh, attacked from the outside. Uh, we know that they attacked them in, in four different ways. We remember how? Do we remember how? <laughs> well, there, there was the, the what now? <laughs> yeah, yeah, they, yeah. They were bullying them for one. They, they were ridiculing them, uh, for one. Any others? Well, after they the ridicule didn't work, they began to try to intimidate them. They gathered all of the armies of the surrounding people together, and they surrounded some in the north, south, east, and west. And, and just trying to intimidate the Jews. Well, when that didn't work, what, what did they do? Well, that was part of the ridicule. When they ridiculed them, they were, they were just, they were shouting all sorts of things to them. Part of it was that, how, do you, how can you think that your God would, would be able to protect you and, and help you build out of this mess that you've got to build with? They criticized their, their, um, the materials they worked with. They just continued to ridicule them. Then they began to intimidate them. When that didn't work, they surrounded them. Uh, well, let's see. Uh, <laughs> in chapter 4. Yeah, they surrounded them. That was part of the intimidation. Any other things? That y'all can think of. They what? Well, Nehemiah's response was that they armed themselves. That was their response. Um, well, they what they well after they were intimidating them, their next thing to do was they tried to cause trouble within. You know, some of the Jews were married to outsiders, and because they were married to outsiders. Those outsiders, um, those Jews were, were then siding some with the outsiders because of the, the hard labor they were having to work. They began to complain and try to stir up strife inside. And then what was last? Well, did, did they... Well, they began to threaten and intimidate them again. And their last thing is that they began to the, the lash out threats. First, when we said the, the intimidation at first, it was just that they surrounded them. Well, now the last thing they done was that they, they actually threatened to attack them. They were trying to strike fear in their hearts. Um, and so the, we know Nehemiah didn't settle for that. He didn't allow that to to really stop them from the work. He brought the people together, told them they were going to pray, and they prayed, and they continued the work. Um, they prayed, and then they, they not only continued the work, but they armed themselves. Uh, those who were on the wall, they were half of them was taken off the work so that they could stand on guard while the others worked. And in the ones that even worked, they were armed also. They had swords with them, and uh, so whenever they had to move from one place to the other, they were protected themselves. Their back was always watched by another armed guard. So here we found that, that that external strife, it wasn't working. So now when we come to chapter 5, there's going to be strife again, but the strife is internal. It's within the Jewish people. It's not from the enemies outside we begin to see some strife that's taking place. And it, it's uh, <laughs> this strife that takes place inside, it begins in a way to threaten the whole way of life for the Jews. It becomes a, a tremendous threat. It's not only threatening to stop them from building, 
but it's threatening to end their existence. Yes, yes, it's always, that, that's always going to carry a little more weight and have a larger effect when your own family, your own family is attacking the family. It's one thing we expect outsiders. It's not as surprising when our neighbors down the road who we haven't met come and steal from us. But it's another thing when our brother or our nephew or our sons and daughters, when they come to our homes and they steal from us. And that, that, there's a different feeling about that. Uh, you're, you're so conflicted, you don't know what to do. You want to love them. You want to get them help, but you want, to, you want to strangle them because they know better. It's hard to get... Those emotions is much greater than when someone you don't know comes and takes it. First thing you want, you get mad, you get angry, then you call the cops. Uh, but when it's family, it does something. You know, the heart is hurt, is church hurt. It's one thing to be hurt by someone, a friend, or even a family member. It's another thing to be hurt by your church. Uh, I said last week something that's kind of harsh. Uh, it, it's God's not really at all interested in our feelings. <laughs> He's interested in building our faith. We don't walk by our feelings. We walk by faith. I don't always feel saved. I rarely ever feel worthy to step into this. As a matter of fact, I've never felt worthy to step into a pulpit to preach. He's not concerned about that. He's concerned about our faith. Do I know he's called me to do this? If I, if I know he's called me, then I do it, regardless of how I feel. Uh, do I know that he's with me? Then no matter what comes my way, I'm looking to him and not looking to my feelings. And so when we get hurt by church, man, that's a, that's a tough hurt for some people to get over. But we don't... We serve in the church. We serve the Lord. And that's what we have to keep in mind. Uh, we serve in the church. The church isn't our God. And actually, we're the church when we go out. When this place is empty, it's just a building. It's a building. But when we're here, it's the church. When we're outside and we're together, it's the, we're the church. So we, we have to keep that that focused in our mind. So Nehemiah here in chapter 5, he begins to face this internal strife from the Jewish people. Um, so it, this was a serious problem because if the strife continued, the rebuilding of Jerusalem and the nation would cease. If this took place, then the people may cease to exist as a nationality. Now, if the people, if the Jewish nation ceased to exist, what kind of problem would that present? <laughs> exactly. Well, one, we wouldn't have got our Lord and Savior because it was declared he was coming from this people. Not only that, but we wouldn't have got what? We wouldn't have got what? <laughs> the word of God. It come through the Jewish people. And so we, we would have been in a mess, wouldn't we? Can you imagine us living in this world and never knowing that there's a Savior? Never having a guide in how to live? And if we didn't have the Bible, what would our laws look like? The laws of our land, what would they look like? No. <laughs> no, there wouldn't be any. It, well, yeah. <laughs> and if, we, if we were without both the world, I mean, the word of God and Jesus Christ, there'd be no light in this world. It would be utter darkness. Utter darkness. Now, yeah, we, we've got to. So God saw fit. You know, God saw what was going on. He saw what would take place. So he had prepared Nehemiah for this time. Um, 
The heavy burden of solving the strife, it rested solely on Nehemiah's shoulders. And if he wasn't able to, to deal with this, um, and Israel was in, a, or Jerusalem, the Jews, they were at a vulnerable time. But God had prepared him. So when we look at this, we find, as we look in chapter 5, let me get, okay, chapter 5, let's look in verses 1 through 4. The Bible says, there was a great outcry of the people and their wives against the Jewish brethren. For there were those who said, we, our sons and our daughters are many. Therefore, let us get grain that we may eat and live. There were also those who said, we have mortgaged our lands and vineyards and houses that we might buy grain because of the famine. There were also those who said, we have borrowed money for the king's tax on our lands and vineyards. So what we know here is there's a, a great outcry of protest in the land of Jerusalem. Uh, the wealthy Jews <laughs> in the middle of rebuilding the walls for, that, that would protect Jerusalem, these rich folks, they were exploiting and they were... Um, extorting from the Jews, from the people, from the poor. Uh, they were trying, really what they were doing was benefiting themselves. They were gaining while the, the rich were getting richer, the poor were getting poorer. And so in desperation, both husbands and wives approached Nehemiah. And this is what's taking place here in these first four verses. Husbands and wives have approached Nehemiah to protest the wealthy in Jerusalem. Let's see, yeah. Can you help me, Brother Mark? Okay, here we go. So there was, we know there was a famine in the land. Um, well, the Jews were, the Jews had been laboring hard for a long time on the wall. Uh, it was bound to cause a shortage for the workers of the harvest. Wouldn't you think? If all the Jewish men are on the wall, Who's in the fields? Without someone in the fields, how are they going to eat? Uh, so here we, we have this, they have this issue. Now we have to remember uh, the, the Jews from the outlying villages, all of them had been summoned for, to provide safety for their families. And, and for the threat that of the surrounding nations, they were called to come here into Jerusalem to help with the wall. So there was no one to work the fields, and things were getting scase. Y'all ever heard that word, scase? They say it a lot around Union Chapel. <laughs> I think they'd say it pretty much around Prospect, too. But that word, scase, it means scarce. <laughs> it's, the, it's the way we, we say scarce. Things were getting slim, slim to nothing. And so as a result, many families began facing a crisis in gathering in a harvest. So all these factors contributed to a serious economic and financial strain that was placed upon the workers. It was a tremendous strain to be out working for this city and your family with nothing. You're not able to really provide for them. That's what was taking place. They were having to borrow money from the wealthy. And... <laughs> It's not always easy to borrow money from the wealthy. Would you agree? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> because there's always usually a catch. There's a reason, well, not all people. There are some people who really work hard. And they work hard to do the right thing. And God just out of his grace and mercy blesses. But then there are those who've gotten extremely wealthy by really taking advantage of other people. We have to agree to that. It's happened all, all over the world for years. So what we find is the rich are oppressing um, three groups of people. The poor, who did not have enough for themselves. Uh, they didn't have enough of food to survive. They were being oppressed. Uh, property owners were being oppressed because they were having to mortgage their fields and their homes just to buy food. 
But not only those, but those who had to borrow money had to pay taxes to the Persian government. This was going to provide another problem. <laughs> so here we have, we have this economic system that was built to really support the rich, to help them to get better. But what they were doing was going completely against the word of God. And we'll see that as we continue. Um, now, this is something that we see today, right? And it's normal for us, but it's an issue in Jerusalem. It wasn't that their enemies were doing this to them. It was their own people, the Jewish people, the wealthy Jews were taking advantage of the poor Jews. So the complaint was loud. This complaint became very loud against the wealthy. Uh, they were helping by they were helping their people by loaning them money. But there's an interest with there's a problem with that. Interest was too high. Interest was just too high for them. The property was demanded for collateral. Your own people taking your own land. So who benefits from that? You're not benefiting. You know, it, it, it just happens. So, you know, we talk a lot about what went on back in the 30s and 40s in Robinson County. And this was going on in Israel. <laughs> this was going on here in Jerusalem in ancient Israel time. So it shouldn't, it's, it shouldn't be no surprise to us when things happen like this. There's evil in the land. There's always been evil from the first sin in the garden. And we see that in the first sin because it, that first sin created such an evil that a brother murdered his brother out of jealousy. Just strictly jealousy. And it weren't jealousy over a woman. It was jealousy over an offering given to God. Now, how, how much more silly can you be? But that's how wicked the mind of man is because of sin. Here, but not only was the interest too high, property was demanded for collateral, and children were also demanded for collateral. Can you imagine that? We're not used to that. Not the way we have to give our child as a slave for collateral. But you know, it's... In our day, what's taking place is, is child slavery in a different form. We call it sex trafficking, prostitution, children being taken. Uh, and we see people on drugs who are pimping out their kids for the next hit that will last them for an hour or so and then the damage that they've done cannot be repaired. You know, this is, this is what we face in our day. We're not too far removed from this time. It's amazing, isn't it? That here we are all these years later <laughs> and we're not very far removed from it. Exactly. We could, we're probably in a worse situation now. Uh, these, these who were committing to rebuilding, the, uh, the rebuilding of Jerusalem was losing what little they had. They were losing their money, they were losing their property, now, and they're losing their kids. The hearts of the wealthy were being really exposed here. They were basically selfish, insensitive, and hard-hearted. Um, selfish, insensitive, and hard-hearted. The love of money is the root of all evil. And we see this here among their own people. Uh, greed and covetousness had gripped, had gripped uh, their hearts so that they were blatantly disobeying God's command. So in Deuteronomy... In Deuteronomy 23, we find that it's unlawful for the Jews 
true brothers in the Lord to charge interest on money that was loaned to one another. It was against God's law. So in actually in Deuteronomy 23, 19 through 20, the Bible says, you shall not charge interest to your brother, interest on money or food or anything that is lent out at interest. To a foreigner, you may charge interest, but to your brother, you shall not charge interest that the Lord your God may bless you in all, in all to which you set your hand to the land which you are entering to possess. Here, God has told them, don't, don't do your don't do your brother. Why, why would he say, don't do your brother that way to the Jews? Why do you think he would say that to them? God had gave it. It wasn't theirs to charge interest for it to begin with. Any other thoughts? Hmm? Love? Yeah. God loved them so much. It was, you know, they were God's people. <laughs> The Jewish people were God's chosen people. And if one Jew was doing another Jew that way, then he was doing God's child, God's chosen person that way. And God said, don't treat my people any kind of way. Um, as a matter of fact, brotherly love was the basic rule between the Jews. A love that was selfless, a love that was sensitive towards the needs of others. No one was to allow greed or covetousness to grip their heart. If they did, they were outside the will of God. So it was, it was also wrong for a fellow Jew to enslave another Jew. They could hire them out as labor, but they were never to enslave them. Leviticus 23, 19, uh, 39 through 40 says, And if one of you brethren who dwells by you. And if one of your brethren who, who dwells by you becomes poor and sells himself to you, you shall not compel him to serve as a slave. As a hired servant, a sojourner, he shall be with you and shall serve you until the year of Jubilee. And at the year of Jubilee, he would be set free unless he chose to stay. And if he chose to stay, he would, no, he would no longer owe a debt, but he would be a hired servant. Yeah. Exodus 22, 25 through 27 says, If you lend money to any of my people who are poor among you, you shall not be like a money lender to them. You shall not charge him interest. If you ever take your neighbor's garment as a pledge, you shall return it to him before the sun goes down. For that is his only covering. It is his garment for his skin. What will, it, what will he sleep in? And it will be that when he cries to me, I will hear for I am gracious. God is saying if he cries out to me because you forgot to give it to him, I'm going to hear him. I'm going to hear him. I'll be gracious to him. Hard and selfish hearts cause all kinds of problems with this society that we're living in. And we, we see that all around. We've seen murders. We've seen rapes. We've seen extortions. We, we see how just being hard, selfish... Uh, it just creates all sorts of problems. Insensitive hearts destroy families. It leads, it leads to adultery, incest, abuse, or any other form of mistreatment. And it's got to be a hard, selfish individual to commit adultery with his brother's wife. Or her sister's husband. It's got to be self. It's a selfish, hard person that would, that would take advantage of a niece or a nephew or a cousin or a child of their own. Uh, it's a hard, selfish person to want to hurt their own family. 
And that's what we're seeing in, in the text here. Hard, selfish, and insensitive hearts can destroy businesses. It leads to lying, stealing, cheating, slander, unjust wages, prejudice, a lack of recognition, or a lack of appreciation in the workplace. Uh, selfish, hard, insensitive hearts. Um, I, I, I haven't figured it out. Somebody might understand some things a little better than I do. How can an industry who profits, not makes, but who profits $350 billion a quarter, a quarter justify three, four, and five dollars a gallon of gas. How can they do it? When they profit 350 billion a quarter. It's greed. It's a hard, selfish, insensitive mindset. When companies care more about the bottom line than they do their employees. So if I make a million dollars this year, but I make 950,000 next year or the following year, uh, I, I've got to either go up on my prices or I've got to lay people off. I mean, how much do you have to have to live off of, you know? No, no when, a, when, a, when a business will take its business overseas where they no longer have to pay $20 an hour and they're getting away with paying $2 an hour. I mean, how can that make people that they're employing happy? They can't. You, you can't justify that outside of greed, selfish, hard, insensitive hearts you know the when when all of these factories started going overseas the, the word was well if we continue the way we're going paying our employees what we're paying them you won't be able to afford a shirt <laughs> they send they send it overseas they cut their profit or they, they don't cut their profit they cut their pay and they still go up in the prices of shirts and pants and shoes and everything else. Nothing changed <laughs> except we lost a lot of jobs. A lot of families were really hurt through this. And it was hurt because people were being selfish and hard and insensitive. Oh, yeah. Well, well let's, let's make it a little, a little closer to home. Uh, we... We done power line work. If I'm a foreman of a crew and I know my men are working and they're coming to work every day, what kind of foreman am I if I'm not helping them get their pay up when I know that they're working for it and they're agreeing it? Why, what kind of leader am I, supervisor am I, if I'm not willing to talk for them because they're making me look good and I'm getting my bonus or I'm getting my raise at the end of the year, but I'm not willing to speak for those who are helping me get mine. You know, that, that's, man, I, I, I don't get that. I don't, I don't understand it. I've, I've had foremen that, man, they, they would run to the owner and say, look, these men need more money. I've had foremen that said they don't need this. And, and he'd sit in his truck with his feet propped up against the, uh, the, wind, the windows while we were out doing the work, but we don't need this. I, I couldn't get that. I understand if you're laying out of work every other day. I get that. But when you go to work regularly and you work while you're there, and that's why, that's why they give you a range for pay. <laughs> but, you know, it's this attitude of I'm going to get mine. Whether you get yours or not, I'm going to get mine. Uh, for the Christian that, that's, we've got to be careful that that's our attitude, that we care so much about our own benefit that we're not willing to help someone else benefit along the way. Uh, truth is, a selfish heart, insensitive heart 
is the cause of some of the most wicked behavior in the world. And there's no way around it. <laughs> it, it, really, it. It really is. It's the cause of some of the most wicked things that we see. Now, when we... Nehemiah gets wind of this. If we, if we look to verse 13... And we can cover this in just a few minutes. Uh, from verse 5 to verse, he said, Yet, now continuing from the people, the people are coming to Nehemiah. Yet now our flesh is as the flesh of our brethren, our children as their children. And indeed, we are forcing our sons and daughters to be slaves. And some of our daughters have been brought into slavery. It is not in our power to redeem. Now, Redeem them for other men have our lands and our vineyards. So here they're losing their children. They're losing and there's no way to get their children back because they don't even own their property anymore. So Nehemiah responds. He says, and I became very angry when I heard their outcry in these words. After serious thought, I rebuked the nobles and rulers and said to them, each of you is exacting usury from his brother. So I called a great assembly against them. And I said to them, according to our ability, we have redeemed our Jewish brethren who were sold to the nations. Now, indeed, you will even sell your brethren? Or how should they be sold to us? Then they were silenced and found nothing to say. Then I said, what you are doing is not good. Should you not walk in the fear of our God because of the reproach of the nations, our en enemies? I also, with my brethren and my servants, am leading, lending them money and grain. Please let us stop this usury. Restore, them, restore now to them, even this day, their land, their vineyards, their olive groves, and their houses. Also a hundredth of the money and the grain the new wine and the oil that you might charge, that you have charged them. So they said, we will restore it. We will require nothing from them. We will do as you say. Then I called the priest and inquired and required an oath from them that they would do exactly or they would do according to this promise. Then I shook out the fold of my garment and said, so may God shake out each man from his house and from his property, who does not perform this promise. Even thus, may he be shaken out and emptied. And all the assembly said, Amen. And praise the Lord. Then the people did according to the promise. Now, Nehemiah got right up in their face. But before he did, you could tell he's angry. As a matter of fact, verse 6 says, And I became very angry. Nehemiah is angry, but he controlled his anger. He controlled his anger. Uh, although he was angry, he was able to control himself. He saw that this terrible social injustice. <laughs> Boy, that's been a familiar word the last 14, 15 months, ain't it? Uh, yeah. It, it, here it was really being committed. The very economy of the Jewish of this new Jewish community and nation was being threatened. The rich had accumulated more wealth while the poor was getting poor. They were suffering. They were being exploited. And after all, the rich, they had the resources to help with the famine. But instead of just helping, they were exploiting the people during the famine. And when you're, when you're willing to exploit people during a famine... That's, a that's, that's tough. When's the worst time to buy a generator? <laughs> when you need it. Yeah, when an ice storm comes or when a hurricane hits. You go looking for a generator, you're going to pay twice what it's worth. If you can find one. And, and, and stores, they know this. I don't, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not blaming the retail stores. I'm, I don't know if they're having to pay extra prices to get them in. I don't know. But somebody is to blame for it. If it was worth, if it was worth $595 on Monday, 
storm hit Monday night, it's worth $595 Tuesday. But because people are in need of one, they say, no, you, you got to pay $995 for it. And you know what people do? If, they, if they're in need, they're going to pay it. They've been extorted. They've been taken advantage of. Um, so it, it angered Nehemiah that his people were being extorted. So he ex- but he exercised restraint. He got alone and he pondered the situation. And that, <laughs> he was angry because he, he heard the outcry, but after serious thought, he tells us now, he got serious about this, and he, he, he gave it thought. He pondered on the situation, and he, he exactly. Now, I probably would have. <laughs> Nehemiah was the man for this time. He, he was the man for this time. He wisely and he carefully spent time thinking about his action and what needed to take place. Everyone was looking to him. They were coming to him with the problem. He had to have a solution. He couldn't have an emotional response. He had to have a solution. And you don't have solutions like that. It's through careful, reasonable thinking. Uh, Action was definitely needed. Something needed to be done for the rebuilding of Jerusalem, and its walls was at risk. In fact, the very future of Israel was at risk. So... Thinking through the problem, thinking about everything that was going on, Nehemiah called a public meeting and he confronted the wealthy nobles. He confronted these officials in the land. He stood face to face with them and he rebuked their sinful, oppressive behavior. So there are five steps he took, five steps. First, he pointed out the inconsistent contradictory behavior of the people. There in verses 7 and 8, he said, After serious thought, I rebuked the nobles and said to them, Each of you is exacting usury from, your, from his brother. Uh, so I called the assembly of them and I said to them, According to our ability, we have redeemed Jewish brethren who, had, who were sold to the nations. And now, indeed, you even sell your brethren? Or should they be sold to us? When he said this to them, they were silent. They had nothing to say. They immediately were convicted. Here, since returning from their exile, they had been buying back their Jewish relatives who were slaves to the Gentiles throughout the Persian Empire. And now the Jews were doing the same thing. They were enslaving their own people. You're buying them back from slavery. Now you're putting them under slavery. Except this time you're profiting rather than the Gentiles. That doesn't make it right. Basically what what Nehemiah is saying, uh, the wealthy was enslaving their own countrymen. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and the fact that they learned this from the Persians and they were willing to do it to their own. It had been one thing to do it to a foreigner, but they were doing it to their own. Man, I, I, <laughs> that'd be like my uncle walking in the house and looking at daddy, pushing him down and saying, I'm going to take your son and he's going he's gonna to do what I tell him to do. And my boys are going to sit up in the house and do nothing. That's basically <laughs> what it was. Uh. Oh, it sure does. It sure does. You're exactly right, Brother Roger. Because if we don't teach our children the Word of God, then when they get out into the world and they go to secular universities, secular high schools, they, they're going to be exposed to so many things. If they don't have a firm foundation, they can get tossed to and fro. Uh, when, yeah. It, what they were doing was against God's plan. And, and they seemed to be okay with it. They didn't see any harm in it. Matter of fact, they, they were, he not only pointed out that they were inconsistent, Nehemiah warned that the wealthy of the land that they must fear God. So obviously they weren't fearing God. 
So he, he basically, he asks them here, he gives a, it's almost a hypothetical situation or not so much hypothetical, but it's, it's almost funny, really. He said, what are you doing? It, what you're doing is not good. Should you not walk in the fear of the Lord? He asked them a question that they, he knew they knew the answer to. Yeah, we, 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 we were to walk in the fear of the Lord. Then why aren't you doing it? That, was, that, w- that would have been the reply. You know, the fear of the Lord means to reverence God and to fear his judgment. A person who fears God is a person who bows before him and he acknowledges that he's the creator and he deserves to be worshipped. To reverence God means to praise and to give thanks for God and all his blessings that he's given us. But a person must also fear the holiness and the righteousness of God. If we ever lose that, that's when we begin to live any kind of way and we become a mockery to the Christian faith. That's more so with the young generation now than it was with us. And, uh, I mean, they're getting straight. Yeah. Oh, uh, you know, when, when, when we're professing to be believers, but we're living careless lives, it's an indication we don't fear the holiness of God. And, and if God is holy and he's making us like his son who was holy, then shouldn't we be holy? That, that, that has nothing to do with our dress. It has nothing to do with how we fix our hair or whether women wear makeup. It's got nothing to do with that. It's got everything to do with our heart. It's got everything to do with our actions. Not our appearance. God's not, he doesn't look at the outer man. He looks at the inner man. Mm. And when we become hypocritical, we're really of, we're really of no benefit to the Christian faith. Because we're a hindrance to others coming into the faith. (laughs) Oh, well, yeah. And the big bang was God spoke. (laughs) That's the big bang. God spoke. Yeah. You know, (laughs) That that's that's my understanding of the Big Bang. I I, I don't I, I wasn't good in science. I, I I struggled in science and biology, but that it, God spoke. Something happened for the world to take place, to be as precise as it is. God spoke. God spoke. Uh, Nehemiah not only challenged them about fearing the Lord, but he challenged the wealthy to be a witness for God. Presently, they were anything but a witness. Instead, their testimony of brotherly love to unbelievers in the world were causing the unbelievers to mock God. Basically, what they were doing, those outside of the Jewish nation, they were mocking them. (laughs) Have you ever heard of this? They're doing their own display. We don't even do that. <laughs> and they want to talk to us about their God. They're crazy. It's like me getting high and wanting to tell somebody about the Lord. Listen, you won't believe this. You really won't believe this. We're, we're in an evangelism class. And the guy started talking about going to gay bars to witness to, for the Lord. I said, if you're wanting to witness to the homosexual community, there's a better place to do it than the bar. Just your presence in the bar is going to distract them away from the gospel. There's a, yes, witness to them going into the bar. As a matter of fact, I remember even as a young Christian, and I was a young teenager, early 20s, I thought, you know, you a, a Christian can go into a club and they can be a witness to, they can go there and just enjoy the music and enjoy the dancing and, and not engage and be a witness. I used to think that 
foolishly, I used to think that, that, that's okay. But I come to understand, yes, that can happen. A Christian can go into these places and not engage in the alcohol and all these other things, but, but it's not a place to be a witness to anybody. No one's interested in your witness in the club. There's a place you can meet them and talk to them about the Lord. But in the club, that's not the place to get their attention. They don't want your attention there. Well, that or they're going to embarrass you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because one thing is when you walk in, you're talking to me about the Lord. Look where you're at. You know, that's the first thing coming out of their minds. Uh, so we, we've got to be very careful of our witness, the things that we're doing, to make sure whatever we're doing is honoring God and not dishonoring him and bringing a reproach against his name. Uh, Nehemiah gave his own personal testimony to the wealthy. He said, look, I understand what you're doing, but look, I'm lending. My servants, they're lending. We're, we're helping them out, but we're not charging them all of this interest. So what you're doing Let's, let's stop this and pay them back everything that they uh, and everything that they had given you anyway. So finally, Nehemiah called upon the wealthy to repent of their sinful and wicked exploitation. He demanded that they return all the po- property that they confiscated. Now, now, the wealthy, they did immediately. This impacted them greatly, and they promised to repent. They promised to return the property with, and the interest that they had accumulated. <laughs> In order to seal this agreement, Nehemiah quickly summons the priests to come and put them under an oath. <laughs> now, I started, I started snickering as I'm reading this. Oh, oh, so you are repenting and you do commit. Oh, let me go get the priest. We got to put this under an oath so you don't back up on it. <laughs> Make sure they were going to do it. And knowing the promises, knowing promises are often aren't carried out, Nehemiah symbolically warned the wealthy. He shook off the wrinkles of his robe or where his robe was folded <laughs> and told him basically, this is what I'm asking God to do to you, shake you off. In other words, kick you out of the family if you don't honor this agreement. And in response... <laughs> Uh, verbally, he asked God to just shake the possessions away from them, their house, any of their wealth. Let them become destitute if they failed to honor up. And he, <laughs> the whole assembly responded with amen. Conviction hit them. Conviction hit them. Now, the wealthy Jews were guilty of oppression and, and exploitation of, of stealing from others. Increase their wealth. Therefore, they needed to repent. So it is with any of us. When we commit sin, we need to repent. We need to turn from whatever wickedness we are committing and turn back to God. Wickedness will result in the land of God's judgment falling upon us. And the only way to escape the judgment of God is to repent, to turn back to Him. Whether rich or poor, if we're committing sin, we must face, we must repent or face the terrifying judgment of God. Luke 13 and 3 says this, but unless you repent, you all likewise perish. Isaiah 55 and 7 says, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him. And to our God, he will abundantly pardon in 2 Chronicles 7 and 14, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. And they had done a great injustice to their own people. Nehemiah pointed it out to them and they responded with repentance. Now, when we move, 
we'll, we'll finish up chapter 5 next week. Chapter 6, they're going to get some more issues coming at them. Keep in mind, if we're going to do God's work, there's always going to be challenges. I said this years ago, and I'll say it today. If ministry is comfortable, chances are we're not doing ministry. Ministry is going to always be uncomfortable. It's going to always be uncomfortable. We're going to find ourselves doing something that, you know, I... I I don't know about Miss Linda and some of these others, but we went on these mission trips. When I come back, I'm thinking, I can't believe I took part in that. You know, I, I can't believe it. It, it was, it just wasn't me. But we've done it, and I was blessed by it. But if we, if we keep continue to look to God, even when the uncomfortable times come, if we're doing it for His glory, He's going to bless it. He's going to bless it.